Welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee. Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. The first item of business is a decision on whether a review of the evidence we received from the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work on the Enterprise and Skill Review next week be in private. Are members agreed? Thank you. The next item on the agenda is to consider the Scottish Minister's annual plan, Planning Period, Scotland Regulations 2016. This SSI is subject to the negative procedure and will come into force unless Parliament agrees to a motion to annul it. No motion to annul has been lodged. Do members have any comments? Thank you very much. The second item of business is the last of the committee's pre-budget scrutiny. Earlier this month, we have heard from Skills Development Scotland, the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Qualifications Authority. This week we have Education Scotland and I welcome to the meeting Dr Bill Maxwell, the Chief Executive, Alistair Delaney, Chief Operating Officer and Graham Logan, Strategic Director, Education Scotland. Before we start, I'd like to put on record the committee's thanks for Education Scotland for meeting with Tavi Scott and Gillian Martin last week. And I understand Dr Maxwell wishes to make a short opening statement. Great, thank you, Convener. And can I start by saying that we welcome very much this opportunity to discuss our work with the committee. Education Scotland's core purpose is ultimately very simple, improving the quality of educational outcomes for Scottish learners. Everything we do is designed to drive improvement in education. As members will be aware, when we were created, the explicit aim was to create a body which could add value through creating closer synergies between how knowledge and expertise gained from evaluation activities feeds through into guidance, development and innovation, and vice versa. The intention was also to create an organisation which could deliberately flex and rebalance the way it deploys its resources and its methods of working across the full range of improvement expertise and activities that now lie within our grasp to provide the right balance of support and challenge required for any particular stage in the National Programme of Education Reform. And at the point we came into being, there were, of course, a number of major strands of reform being developed and implemented across the whole education system. Of course, most prominent amongst these, uh, and I'm sure we'll end up talking a lot about this, has been Curriculum for Excellence. But I should point out there have also been major changes driven forward in a range of other areas, each of which have involved a role for Education Scotland in supporting their implementation to some extent. So that includes getting it right for every child, the Additional Support for Learning Act and the expansion of early years provision. It includes a reform of teacher education and CPD from teachers Teaching Scotland's Future. It includes developing Scotland's young workforce, structural reform of the college sector, career services and modern apprenticeships, and the development of new strategies for youth work and adult learning, and indeed community empowerment. All of this together, taken in the context of inevitably tight constraints on public resources, has meant that it has been appropriate for Education Scotland to set the balance of our activity quite strongly towards development guidance and support functions over the first few years of our existence to ensure we played our part in supporting these major change programmes through periods of major transitional change. This approach reflected Minister's priorities and has had strong external endorsement. The positive comments, for example, from last year's OECD report on Scottish education about Education Scotland being the linchpin organisation in CFE reform programme, for example, uh, reflects the effectiveness which I believe we've adapted our functions to play our role. However, we are now moving into a new phase in the development of Scottish education. Uh, again, the OECD have a widely quoted phrase of this being a watershed uh, moment in the implementation of CFE. And the report was very clear in saying we are on the right track with the direction of Scottish education reform. The challenge they have now put to Scottish education system is to move forward boldly to realise the full potential of all the reforms and changes in which we have invested collectively over the last decade or so. And as we do so, to become more focused and more specific about the improvements we need to make. And with that shift in the educational reform journey very much in mind, the, the balance of Education Scotland's work is now changing. The need for the agency to prioritise the development of generic curriculum-wide guidance and support to help the implementation of new structures uh, is, is lessening, and some more targeted work will still be important in certain priority areas of the curriculum, like STEM, for example. 
But as that demand for generic curriculum development lessens the need for evaluation work and for work which drives forward targeted improvement initiatives is increasing, as does the need for the active dissemination and spread of what we're learning about the impact of new approaches that are being developed and implemented in schools across the country. So as part of the response to that changing demand, we do intend to build up our commitment to evaluation activities, like our inspection and review programmes, to help ensure we can provide a strong flow of evidence about what works and spread that across the system. In addition, we've also shifted the balance of our activities to ensure that we play an effective role in providing strong professional leadership for the new, more focused drive for improvement in the key priority areas that the new national improvement framework so clearly sets out. We played a key role in supporting the development of the NIF, working with policy colleagues, and we have a substantial programme of work underway to support the implementation of the national improvement framework in a whole variety of ways going forward. And in what is certainly the largest rebalancing of our resources over the last year, we have also established a major new programme of work to provide national professional leadership for one of the NIF's most prominent national priorities, that, that of closing the poverty-related attainment gap. We've worked in very close partnership with policy colleagues to help design and develop the Scottish Attainment Challenge throughout 2016. We've built and developed a team of 32 attainment advisors supported by other educational specialists, and we're playing a lead role in brokering collaboration across the country uh, to ensure the programme thrives. But I'd like to close my comments with an example of how the agency has flexed uh, our resource to address some pressing shorter term issues, which required us to deploy both our evaluation and our guidance functions in, in synchrony. This is a work focused on the need to simplify, streamline and refocus aspects of CFE implementation, where a complexity and lack of clarity had grown through the years of development and rollout. Through the delivery plan, and indeed in some cases prior to that, Education Scotland committed to undertaking a range of actions to achieve this streamlining. We are taking action ourselves to dramatically reduce the amount of guidance material and content on our websites, providing a more easily accessible and integrated offer for schools. In May, we developed and delivered a clear statement of advice to every secondary head teacher on planning for transition from the broad general education to the senior phase, responding in part to some apparent confusions and poor practice that we were seeing emerging in schools. We developed and published a well-received set of assessment benchmarks for literacy and numeracy in August, and shortly thereafter, I also launched a concise statement setting out in one place the definitive package of CFE support what teachers need to know to deliver CFE effectively. And on the evaluation side, we undertook a review of how the 32 local authorities had been, uh, to what extent they'd been successful in tackling bureaucracy at their own part. So I'll close on that. Next year, we are developing our corporate plan. We'll be looking to engage very widely with stakeholders and, of course, taking account of whatever may come out of the governance review as we do so. But in the meantime, look forward to discussion with the committee. Thank you very much, Dr. Maxwell. Uh, I've got a couple of questions before I open up to my, my colleagues. One of them is um, both yourself and SQA clearly play very important roles in, in Scotland's education. What working relationship, what close communication do you have? Because it's, uh, it would seem to me sensible that the, the two of you work very closely together. Yes, thanks, Convener. We do have very close relationships uh, at every level, and it, particularly around the development of the new qualifications our staff meet regularly with them. I, of course, meet regularly with Janet. And we all sit on a range of the key committees, like the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board and the Assessment National Qualifications Working Group, which uh, collectively plan the action that's needed to be taken at any one point. But we are, in a, and particularly in planning the support for teachers, there's been a range of uh, joint working, indeed, uh, conferences where we have uh, convened events, for example, for secondary head teachers that the SQA and ourselves both contribute to in parallel. So, very close working relationships exist. For you sure. say there's no um, evidence of silos there, there's no evidence of SQA here, Education Scotland there. It's almost like an amorphous beast at times. It's a very integrated and collective uh, approach, I would say, yeah. I mean, we're clear about our own responsibilities for sure, but. Uh, but not silos, absolutely not. We do communicate. Okay, I'm sure that some of my colleagues might want to come back in on that. The, 
One of the things that came across, we, we met with a, a group of teachers, and one of the things that came across, and, and from some of the inputs in the survey, etc., is that communication, which was a big issue we had last week, but also communication seems to be an issue. For example, the, the teachers are talking about the guidance. There's been a lot of positive comments about the guidance and advice that's there, but they're saying, many people are saying it's very, very difficult to locate. Now, surely there's a, a communication issue there. And also, when you look at the, some of the statistics that say that, you know, over 60 per cent say that the guidance support build the capacity of education providers to improve their performance continuously, they say no. Now, you would obviously say you're doing a good job, but if you're doing a good job, and there's over 60 per cent of people are saying that they don't think you're doing a good job, there's a, a communication issue. I take on the point about uh, simply navigating the amount of stuff that has been uh, built up over years. And actually, I'm old enough to be a veteran of previous curriculum developments like 5 to 14 and higher still. And I think we've certainly reached a point in the programme where, for good reasons throughout the development and early implementation of our programme, there has been a demand for a, a great deal of guidance, support, exemplification. Uh, that now needs to be stripped right back. Uh, and we have... Uh, we're rebuilding our websites, actually, to a much uh, sharper... In fact, Graham's involved in that. Maybe i ask him to chip in a little with uh, some exemplification of how, exactly how much a, of a reduction and focusing of that resource it is. Uh, but it is quite dramatic, uh, so we'll be launching a new, guide, new guidance websites for teachers with uh, a much more streamlined and accessible set of resources. Yes, thanks, uh, Bill. Uh, we've certainly been working with teachers and others to reduce the amount of online content. So we're about to, in December, launch our new National Improvement Hub and corporate website, which will represent a 90% of reduction in the amount of case studies and materials. So there's around 20,000 pages of examples and case studies that have built up, requested over the years by the management board and others to show different examples of CFE. We're stripping that right back to the absolute core materials as a result of the OECD directive about streamlining and clarifying. So that's a dramatic change. We're also exploring new ways to reach all teachers. So for example, a definitive statement on curriculum for excellence that Bill described, we worked with the General Teaching Council to email that directly to every teacher in Scotland. As a result, that, that uh, piece of guidance was downloaded more than 50,000 times. So we, we're looking at new ways of reaching individual teachers with absolute key messages and bringing real clarity uh, to the material that's produced. Because clarity is something that doesn't seem to have been forthcoming, not just in your own organisation, but in others. I mean, the National Parents Forum of Scotland re refused to participate in, in this because they said that they couldn't understand your submission. submission for this. So, yeah. you know, obviously, clarity doesn't mean that you pair, just mean that you pair back. It means that you use language that everybody else can understand because nobody's more important in this than the parents yeah. of the, the pupils that we're trying yeah. to improve. Yeah, I could say I was, I was disappointed to see the NPFS uh, response on this, and, and we've talked to them since actually just to uh, uh, have further understand what exactly they were saying. But generally speaking, we work pretty closely with NPFS and have done over a period of time with a particular focus on developing parent-friendly materials uh, around the implementation. There's a particular series called the... Uh, nutshells. nutshells, that's... Get, get it right. The, uh, that have taken a whole range of issues in CFE and expressed in clear terms. Actually, they're pretty popular with teachers too. Uh, nice, clear terms of uh, what's happening around assessment or different aspects of CFE. Uh, so we also run Parent Zone, of course, which is a website. Uh, I suspect many folk out there probably realise we, we develop it, but we develop that in close partnership with NPFS. So generally speaking, we have uh, a good, strong relationship with them and a good focus on uh, making things accessible for parents. We'll take on board the comments they made in the that was, Of course we will. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to a governance and relationship with ministers, etc. Liz, do you want to come in first? Yes, Dr. Maxwell, I wonder if I could start with uh, some issues to do with uh, the inspection process. Could you tell us which other countries in the world have uh, the inspectorate within the same body that is looking at curriculum development and school policy? The international picture of uh, how inspection is organised is uh, extremely wide and varied. In fact, there are, uh, the particular UK tradition of having inspe separate inspectorates uh, is something which is 
relatively uh, thin, there's not many other countries have inspectorates of that sort. Uh, I would recognise that certainly it is uh, a relatively new step we have taken in taking inspection, bringing it together with development to create this new integrated improvement body. Uh, it's attracted a lot of interest from other countries around the world, I have to say. There are some agencies who are, have some similarities with us. Norway, we deal with a lot, who also have a body that does both evaluation, at least at a system level, and development work uh, in another of its arms. Uh, it's seen as an interesting and developmental way going forward, I think. Uh, and I should emphasise that in the Scottish approach, and this is different also from other parts of the UK in many respects, we are effectively looking at a three-tier, a three-level model of quality assurance. So fundamentally, uh, our strongest emphasis has been over many years now building up capacity for self-evaluation at school level and for schools to be openly reporting back on their own performance to their parents. That's the first level, if you like, of quality assurance, and we've put a huge amount of effort into that. The second level is then at local authority, quality assurance level, where we expect local authorities to be uh, keeping track of the performance of their schools and reporting, as they do publicly, uh, to their education committees and otherwise. And the third level is our own role now, which has evolved increasingly into a role where we sample provision right down to the classroom level in every local authority across the country uh, on a regular basis, but uh, the three are interlinked, so quality assurance is not simply about our inspection activity, although it's an important part of it. Did I just go on the yeah. specific issue, though, about yeah. the inspectorate being part of the body that is looking at curriculum development? and sure. school, school policy, because I think that's the thing that's interesting uh, the yeah. wider public. Um, and Lindsay Patterson makes the quote that education in Scotland is responsible for developing the curriculum for excellence and through the inspectorate for evaluating. This risks a conflict of interest. Keir Bloomer says having development and inspection functions within a single organisation has a, introduced a fundamental and irreconcilable conflict of interest into the heart of the government's main educational agency. Do you accept that criticism? No, I don't accept that criticism. And it, fundamentally, all the functions that we contain within our organisation are about improvement fundamentally. And what I do, uh, what I think on a, on sits underneath that is a, a bit of a misunderstanding around who develops the curriculum fundamentally, because Ed Education Scotland does not go off on its own and develop and produce uh, policy on the curriculum. Indeed, policy on the curriculum in Scotland is a very collective effort Fundamentally, the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board is the body. It's your yeah. responsibility to deliver that? It is our responsibility to help support the translation of policy into act, uh, effective action at the front line. So we work collectively with our partners in the Curriculum for Excellence yeah. Management Board, for example, in agreeing, consulting with stakeholders to agree the kind of guidance that yeah, they would but like. Dr Maxwell, the, the, the guidance yeah. that comes uh, to teachers... Uh, it may be a collective effort, but the, yeah. the responsibility for that delivery lies with Education Scotland, surely. The responsibility for providing guidance that matches the policy we've all agreed certainly lies with us. Indeed. And if that guidance needs to change, it is changed. Uh, we, have a, uh, we regularly do change, as we've discussed earlier. We've taken major steps to make that guidance clearer if, folk, if there are confusions around it. Would, would you accept, however, that in the job that you do in terms of uh, delivering that with the responsibility that you've just outlined, you are acting as judge and jury to be able to deliver that and also to do the inspectorate job. And why I'm interested in what other countries are doing is that there doesn't seem to me to be very many countries around the world who have a system where the inspectorate is part of the same system, the same body that is developing the curriculum. I would argue there are huge advantages, actually, in having the two better connected. Uh, whilst LTS and HMIE in the past always did work quite closely together in terms of trying to feed messages back and forth to each other, uh, it has become much more easy now with the integrated agency. So to take an example, uh, where we have uh, guidance on technologies, which is probably the first area, digital technologies, particularly computing and areas like that, where the original curriculum guidance produced back in 2009 uh, might have been fine at the time. It's clear in 2016 it needs updated. 
Uh, we're seeing that from our inspection activity. We're also picking that feedback up from a, a variety of other areas. And we're now able to immediately translate that into action to update those guidelines. So we have our development arm, as we speak, consulting around new experiences and outcomes, an update of the experiences and outcomes to take account of the fact that we no longer have floppy disks and all the rest of it. Uh, and that shows, I think, exactly the kind of synergies we can get from uh, picking up evaluation evidence from one part of our organisation, which operates under strict firewalls to ensure it does report without fear or favour. So you're denying there's any conflict through. of interest, despite the criticism that comes um, from education experts and indeed from many teachers who've given submissions. You deny there's any conflict of interest. I think there are healthy synergies that, uh, and there is no real conflict of interest that has arisen in practice, no. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Joanne. Yep, thank you very much. Maybe if I continue this point, I'm interested in your role as giving independent advice to ministers. So you give independent advice to ministers and say, I don't think that's wise. The ministers say, we're going to do it anyway. It's, it's been developed in schools and the inspector is establishing that there is it's a shambles, it isn't working. How can it possibly be that Education Scotland is going to report that something that they've advocated on behalf of ministers, even though they weren't in favour of it, how can they have a, um, an honest assessment of what's happening in schools if, it's, if, it's the, if they're arguing the case for it in the first place? It's absolutely vital. I mean, you, you, you describe our role very accurately. We can inform, I think it's our duty to inform ministers with accurate evidence about whether policy A is, in our view, the right direction in the first place, and B, once it's being implemented, whether it's having the desired effect that was intended from it. Uh, it's ultimately for ministers and to policy officials to do, uh, determine whether they follow th that advice and to what extent or not. Against that, whilst that's going on, it's absolutely vital that we do actually report accurately what we're seeing on the ground. Uh, I've often had this conversation with ministers, and I've never had a minister disagree with me that we as an organisation wouldn't be much use to them if we were, in a sense, telling them what they wanted to hear, but not reflecting accurately what was happening on the ground in terms of the, the real picture. So hence inspection, which operates, as I say, under a strict code of practice to ensure it is, uh, reports without fear or favour and is, is professionally led, uh, gives us that evidence. It is a unique selling point of the agency, I guess, that we do. We are in schools week in, week out across the whole country and do have that reach in to see what's actually happening at the front line. So it is a responsibility on us, absolutely, to surface that evidence uh, faithfully and accurately and feed it back in to ministers, but also to the, the bodies like the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board and others who are taking collective decisions about what seems to be working and what isn't working. So you're really just providing information rather than being the education agency? We are providing professional, uh, professional advice, which is based on frontline information. Can you give me any examples of where government policy has changed as a consequence of you realising that on the ground government policy isn't working? In fact, it's detrimental? There's certainly, uh, I mean, if I go back to our May statement, which we put out uh, around the way that Borough General Education Senior Phase were being implemented. That's a clear example of where some issues we were seeing emerging in schools on the ground resulted in a need for policy to be clarified to schools uh, and some clear guidance given. So that's so what the May statement contained. So the clarification yeah. goes to people trying to implement the policy rather than those who have developed a policy that's causing problems? Indeed. The, advice was pretty clear that there were certain misunderstandings around uh, the intention of policy that needed to be uh, Which is not really... I would have thought there needs to be an agency that says to government, this is what's happening on the ground, you need to change the policy. What you're saying is what happens is this is a problem on the ground, we'll change the guidance because they're getting it wrong, they're misunderstood. There aren't any examples of government policy changing. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are examples where there have been changes made as a result of um, independent inspection evidence. Uh, for example, the amount of assessment and the assessment burden uh, we, we highlighted several times and therefore 
there was a change to uh, assessment materials and guidance. I think also in the formation of policy, if we think of the national improvement framework, the assessment model, we heavily influenced through our independent evidence and advice that we needed to place standardised assessment in the context of teachers' professional judgment. So a uh, heavy influence there to ensure that the policy was educationally uh, effective and uh, made sense uh, to teachers. So I think there is an ongoing relationship where uh, we are providing professional advice to ministers and policy colleagues. We're surfacing evidence from inspection. I mean, the statement about curriculum for excellence in August, the definitive statement, pulled together all the evidence that we've seen. We're just about to publish a three-year analysis of inspection trends across different education sectors, making it very clear independently, in our view, what the strengths are in the different sectors and the, the challenges and areas for improvement. So that evidence is there. It's continually feeding improvement. It's continually feeding the feedback not just to ministers and policy colleagues, but to the teaching profession. And that is a, a unique selling point of having an improvement agency that can draw on all the functions that we've described. Just, maybe just uh, my sense, uh, uh, to get my head around who's responsible for what. Last week, we, ra we raised with SQA concerns, genuine concerns about equality in education because the end of certification for all and the N4 been seen something that was of not any great value and the narrowing of the curriculum um, in order to meet the needs of, of the senior phase. Whose responsibility, who made that decision, for example, that there would be no external assessment of uh, N4s um, and that there should be a narrowing of, of the curriculum in the senior phase, which is having consequence in terms of subject choices. Some teachers have highlighted um, that there's a, a reduction in, for, for example, young people at, going to STEM subjects or whatever it might be. Who's who made th those decisions and who's accountable for them? The SQA made it clear that it's not their role. They're a delivery agency. Is it, you, is it Education Scotland or is it government ministers? Fundamentally, those, uh, those are exactly the sort of decisions that are discussed and agreed in great depth through this Curriculum for Excellence Management Board in that case, which, of course, is a, an establishment set out by government uh, to drive policy making around the curriculum for curriculum for excellence generally. So we all sit on that. Uh, we all feed evidence and views into that. And those are very active points of discussion. I and mean, in the, the National Four one, for example, uh, there clearly are issues around that. Uh, the answer is not necessarily, in my view, to uh, introduce an external exam in order uh, to give it uh, credibility. I think that's, we have a situation where Lots of further education colleges manage uh, internal assessment with great credibility, and uh, so well, there will be very answers. It's not about credibility, it's about equal valuing of um, the courses that young people are doing, which is, has been evidence. Which can also be, uh, uh, as I say, college courses going up to SCQF level six can be internally assessed and, and is it conceivable, have credibility. Is but it conceivable that this management board for yep. curriculum for ev um, excellence will take a view that's contrary to the view of the education agency in Scotland? If you go to that body and say, well, we think X, yeah. is there any conceivable circumstance where that board would then say, no, we don't agree with you? We're going to, because what you seem to be saying is, yeah. it's a collective responsibility. This other group that's not you, they make the decision. I'm not quite sure who yeah. they're accountable we have, to. We have a voice in that, in that body. Voice. We don't have a veto, no, I would say that. We don't uh, fundamentally... So uh, maybe, that is a body set possible, up by ministers. It may yeah. be possible that the, the body charged with the responsibility for education in Scotland could be outvoted or out, you know, ignored through this management board. If you were saying explicitly you don't think X should happen, it could still happen. I would say, indeed, it could if ministers chose to do that. We do not run the education system, I should add. We are not charged with responsibility in that absolute sense for running the schools any or running the education system in Scotland, we're charged with responsibility for implementing what government policy is on issues like CFE management board after due discussion negotiation with all stakeholders concerned. Uh, so fundamentally, that's, that's the position. Thank you, convener. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tavish, you've got some questions? Thank you, convener. Just on the same theme, um, who chairs the 
the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. Fiona Robertson is Director of Learning. Uh, so, civil service. Scottish government. government yeah. So, yeah. when when um, you all collectively agreed, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dr. Alexander, but, but when you all collectively agreed that narrowing the choice for science subjects at the senior phase in secondary school uh, would mean that uh, young people couldn't take three sciences at schools, because that was clearly known and understood. That was an agreed decision. You all decided that was that was the, the compromise that had to happen. The model of secondary uh, senior phase and broad general education worked through uh, was agreed and understood very much, yeah. So, so mean, for kids who want to do three sciences at hasten... senior phase, three sciences at senior phase, uh, to continue jo Joanne Lamb's correct question about yeah. STEM subjects, which is a commitment of government and uh, something we all share, uh, it was known when you discussed that, because I presume you did discuss that in that management board, the implications for all of you, and therefore for schools and for young pupils, was that pupils would not be able to take three sciences in one sitting and therefore get into university on that basis. Yeah. Graham, do you want to come in, Mr Scott, on that? I think the senior phase by design is a three-year experience, so it's not helpful. Please, I know yeah. that. You're telling me things so I know. I'm asking you a specific question about three sciences in one year. Did you discuss it and the, and the consequences of the decisions you made collectively, which you've just been telling us as how you do it, that was the consequence of that decision? I think the, the choices about the design of the curriculum are taken at local level. Oh, that's someone so else's curriculum, fault. curriculum for Excellence is a broad national framework. No, no that's not good enough. So locally. are you saying you didn't discuss the implications with the SQA sitting there, Education Scotland, chaired by a civil servant, you did not discuss the logic of what you were agreeing on choice for pupils at S5 in Scottish schools? We did, in, in great depth. And I can say the universities were part of that as well, actually, and therefore universities uh, signed up to what the kind of, kind of qualifications and the patterns that would emerge from the three-year senior phase. I think we've had different... Uh, and analysis. therefore, uh, say, I mean, I'm not... The demands for different patterns of uh, qualifications for entry to university were discussed in great depth, for example, whether... Uh, students needing to get into medicine in Glasgow or Edinburgh, uh, how the universities would react and respond and adapt their selection procedures so that the uh, pupils would certainly not be disadvantaged and would indeed get the qualifications and the appropriate level of training that they needed prior to going into university. Uh, and as far as we're, uh, we're very clear that, in fact, the, the current output from uh, CFE, the amount of hires... Uh, pass rate, in, or the number of passes and hires has been increasing. Uh, we have, over the last couple of years, the highest figures we've had in many, t many years, more kids getting into university. So, uh, yeah. really specific was. patterns, uh, well, I, I would asking, say, I and it's probably never been possible and, to do three you've, uh, you've, sciences in most schools. Um, uh, you've moved away from that. Um, yeah. On Liz Smith's point, um, could you, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that when the changes to unit assessments were published uh, in September, the announcement of that was made by, um, by you, Dr. Maxwell, in your capacity as Chief Inspector. The piece of paper that I've seen, which went to all schools, uh, has that, has that um, announced as uh, you as Chief Inspector. Could you explain why, as opposed to Chief Executive of Education Scotland? Sorry, is, is a question about why the unit assessment was announced or about the job title? The job title. All right. My job title, my job fundamentally does, uh, well, I think of it as having three dimensions, to be honest. Uh, one is chief executive of the corporate body of Education Scotland. It certainly subsumes the role that I previously held as head of the inspector or chief inspector, uh, which heads up the inspection function with all the firewalls around it. And indeed, there's also a role which is very much around being the chief advisor, if you look at it that way, to ministers on professional educational but matters. Line, but to continue so, my yeah. colleagues' points, what you issued to schools about, an, about assessments was issued uh, in the, under the title of Chief Inspector. Therefore, they're going to take that as a statement of absolute writ. If it comes from the Chief Inspector, that is a statement of absolute writ. You better follow it or else. It's a statement of advice okay, and it's so clear you, that... Do you not understand yeah. the point we're all making about this it. clear conflict that that is? Clearly not. <laughs> okay, I give up. I give up. Right, thank you. <laughs> I give up. Okay, that was very sudden. And can I just get some yeah. clarification here? The, the, there seems to be a point where uh, Tavish was saying that you can't do three sciences. Uh, is that a national position? Graham, Logan, Mr Logan, you said that it's down to local authorities. Over the course of the whole 
purpose was to create a three-year experience so that young people could do more qualifications, more achievements than ever before. But the decisions on how many subjects and how to design and organise the curriculum is a local decision within a broad national framework. That is the premise of Curriculum for Excellence. But within the broad national framework, does that exclude doing three sciences in the one year? Not necessarily. I mean, we can look into the, the detail of that. I, I need to double check the, that specific point. We can come back to you. But over the course of the three years, it's designed as a three year experience. Yeah, so that. looking at one year in isolation is not helpful. It undermines the purpose of, and there's more young people staying on at school beyond S4 than ever before. And that was part of the design of Curriculum for Excellence. But well, we, can bring, we can clarify the position on science. I appreciate for the if you'd committee. come back to us with some clarification on that. Thank you very much. Ross Thompson. <clears throat> um, in their submission to the committee, the EIS um, raised concerns over what they called the increasingly politicised role of Education Scotland. Um, they actually stated the EIS continues to have concerns also over the increasingly politicised role of Education Scotland within Scottish education, that questions remain about the independence of the inspection process and that Education Scotland has been reticent to challenge the misconceptions and or politically motivated approaches of civil servants and ministers. Are there are sufficient safeguards in place to protect against undue political influence on education in Scotland. Yes, thanks. I'm comfortable. I, I note that comment from the trade union, uh, I, but would be confident and assure you that there are appropriate safeguards very much in place around uh, education in Scotland. And of course, education in Scotland's relationship to government, we're an executive agency of government, exactly the same as HMIE was in, in prior to the merger. Uh, the same arrangements apply, framework documents in the public domain, which sets out how the relationship works, if, if folk are interested to explore that. Again, really uh, pretty much identical to what was there for HMIE. Uh, Alistair could explain a little more, I think, about the code of practice and, and the firewalls that exist. As in yes, um, inspectors in Scotland are appointed HM inspectors, so they're approved through the Privy Council, um, and that therefore carries a level of, of independence, and all our inspectors are very clear about what responsibilities that places upon them. Um, my role, in addition to Chief Operating Officer, within the framework document is also stated as Director of Inspection, um, and I've got a duty, a protective role, if you like, to make sure that we operate impartially um, in carrying out our, our scrutiny obligations, and I can take that to wherever it needs to go if I felt that that was ever impinged. Um, that was what was written in as a safeguard when the, the agency was created. Um, our inspection function operates, as uh, Bill said, without fear or favour. Um, that's what we are there to do. We are there to report what we find. And we are there to report what we find in terms of how it is for children, learners, adult learners in Scotland. Um, and that is our main uh, focus when we go out into, into inspect in all settings, including schools. Um, so it's very much clear, our processes are very clear about ensuring that there is no opportunity for interference in any of the judgments that we make. And those judgments are reported through um, at appropriate times to say this is what we have found and it is what we have found. Thank you. I appreciate the reassurance and the, the clarity you've given, which leads me nicely on to the next um, concern that the EIS raised in the advisory committee of, which was, I quote, even the simple fact that employees of Education Scotland were reclassified in 2011 as civil servants is indicative of this centralisation which has occurred, with no discernible gain to the Scottish education as a result. Uh, rather, the function as an organisation that is objective and independent of the political slants and motivations of government, Education Scotland appears, publicly at least, to be politically compliant. Therefore, given what you've just told me, can you tell me what has your experience actually been? And is this not a fair criticism from the EIS, particularly around about centralisation? Uh, first, I'd like to just nail an early point there. Inspectors were civil servants before the merger, uh, so that was no change. The change applied there to the... LTS, former Learning Teaching Scotland staff, I guess, who were in an NDPB prior to the, the merger. So, so really that had no impact on the inspection function where independence is so important. But uh, beyond that, I, I think uh, we occupy an interesting space. I think inevitably as, as an agency, we do need to provide that robust independent advice. At times, I suspect that means that uh, Folk like the professional associations will think we're too close to government. It may also mean at times the civil servants and, and ministers think we're too close to the views of the professional associations, but we need to 
keep an honest middle ground in providing advice uh, based on what we're actually seeing in practice and the professional expertise. And, and we do recruit uh, from the best uh, educators in the country. Uh, so we have a high level of independent professional expertise uh, within the organisation to offer. Um, convener, I'd also like to pick up a, on a point that was raised by the Auditor General um, in the submission again to the committee, uh, where they raised um, a number of specific governance issues, uh, stating that uh, as the management board had only met once, that there was a risk that it is not fulfilling their duties as outlined uh, within the terms of reference. Um, so, Dr. Max, well, can you explain why is the board only met once and why are you, are you risking failing in your duties? Sure, I can give you some uh, background on the management board. We, as an executive agency, uh, I should start by explaining we have an advisory board. It uh, doesn't have the functions you'd expect a board to have if, it, if we were further out from government, if you like, like NDPB. Uh, but they are important uh, for us and we use them effectively. Alistair, as Chief Operating Officer, will be able to explain. Yeah, I mean, the, um, Audit Scotland were correct in their report, which they supplied for the year two. 31st March 16, um, obviously that's where you're quoting from. Um, and as much as formally um, we did not have the four meetings which were originally planned for a number of reasons, what we did do though at the, with the agreement of our non-executive directors was they came along to two sessions um, with our senior team, not just ourselves but our assistant directors as well who run their programmes of work, to talk about our business planning and to engage in that process. And they did that once uh, in the December of 2015 and once in the January. It was a really important time because we were changing from a structural approach to planning our work to going to a programme approach, which we've outlined in, in our submission. And we agreed with the management board at that point that it would be really helpful to have the non-executive directors rather than have a formal uh, management board meeting that they would engage with these two full day sessions. And in addition, one of them, they held a special meeting with the senior team about the direction and future vision for the organisation. That covers two. The last one just so happened that the March meeting, which was planned, um, had to be moved due to holidays to the April, which then knocked it over the financial year. Um, in the course of this current year, we have uh, fulfilled all our obligations in relation to the planned meetings of both Audit and Risk and Management Board, and they are planned through to the end of the financial year. Okay. Um, just to, to, to follow up briefly on that particular point, uh, in relation to the, meet, the four meetings up to 31st of March 16, you said there was obviously a number of reasons that didn't happen. I presume when you're moving board meetings or fundamental board meetings are ha not happening, then these number of reasons must be of most critical importance that you wouldn't meet. But what, what sort of reasons <laughs> were there that you couldn't meet as a board? that we couldn't meet, we agreed with the non-executive directors, it was more productive for them to engage with our, uh, in, in a workshop, a full day workshop with our corporate leadership team on uh, the planning and the new approaches we were taking to planning. As an advisory board, they are keen to help us by bringing their different experiences and expertise that we don't have inside the organisation to bear on new developments. And so we agreed with them that that was an appropriate way forward. Um, the, the Easter meeting, if you like, which had to move over technically over the financial year was just due to a clash in holidays. Obviously, we have to have a quorum to have the, the management board function, and we just had to move it a few weeks, which knocked it over the reporting year for Audit Scotland. Okay, thank you. And, and lastly, um, in convener, um, Mark Priestley, in his submission, um, states that there's been, and I quote again, an increased need for bureaucratic tick box, uh, box ticking, uh, which in turn has increased uh, workload. So I would like to ask, um, Dr. Maxwell, when will teaching go back to being about giving young people the very best education rather than teaching being simply a culture of bit box ticking? That's exactly uh, the intention of Curriculum for Excellence is to uh, provide a rich, broad education in which young pe uh, teachers actually have great flexibility to design the curriculum to suit themselves. We are very strongly against any notion of a tick box culture. We notice uh, we note Mark's concerns about that. Where I would uh, agree with aspects of what Mark's saying is that one of the challenges for schools uh, in the new arrangements under Curriculum for Excellence is the capacity of their leadership and, and staff to design and, and develop rich curricula 
for themselves within broad guidance. Uh, some schools doing that very well, others uh, needing more support in order to do that. And I know Mark himself has done some very useful work with East Lothian, I think, uh, one of the Lothian councils in working with heads around that. Uh, so that's really important part of the development going forward because the last thing we want, certainly, uh, or intend is a tick box culture to develop. Graham, did you want yeah, to no, I think we, we brought further clarity to that, um, Mr. Thompson, with the statement in August where we said two resources for teachers to use, experiences and outcomes for planning, benchmarks for assessment, and that strips it right back. We've then done a, a workload review of local authorities to see how the attempts to reduce bureaucracy are being implemented, and we'll be following that up again. But we have stripped it right back and made it very clear that we expect teachers to use just those two resources for planning and assessment to try and cut out um, any other bureaucracy that, that's grown. And we'll continue to monitor that, both in what we produce ourselves and what local authorities uh, demand of schools. Thank you very much. And very, very briefly on that, um, this committee had uh, an away day um, when we first uh, came together and we went to Stirling. We actually met with secondary head teachers, primary head teachers. Uh, a lot of the feedback the group that I had from teachers was round about the box ticking culture and a wonderful folder about this size as was presented to, to members to say, this is what we've got to go through, this is all the boxes we've got to tick. And um, I, I appreciate you don't want there to be a box ticking culture, but clearly from what we could see, that's an inherent part of the job right now. It was an important message also from the review we undertook of the 32 local authorities and how they were translating uh, national intention, if you like, into local guidance on for their schools about planning and assessment. Uh, and in a number of cases, we were seeing evidence of uh, too much emphasis on assessing every level tick box culture. So we've sent strong messages through that tackling bureaucracy review in August uh, to counter that. And we've got a very specific picture on each local authority. We know that just under half, 15 of the local authorities in our independent view have been proactive at reducing workload and bureaucracy. And we're following up with the others where there, there's further action to take to make sure that happens. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Daniel? Um, I'd just like to start by following up uh, on one of uh, Ross Thompson's points. I mean, uh, his initial question about the EIS evidence you, made, you answered that by referencing what you're already doing. And forgive me, um, but the, the, the allegations they make, they're making are, are pretty serious, that, that essentially you're, you're, the inspection regime is overly close to government. And again, your proximity precludes you really from providing the objective advice to government. Are, are they, is that a baseless allegation? Uh, or, or why are they saying that? I mean, could you please address why you think they, they might have, have put that so starkly in evidence to this committee? Yeah, I mean, I do reject that, and uh, I do understand they are a professional association uh, who represents strong uh, views from the profession, if you like, around certain issues. There will be issues where, uh, to take the assessment and the introduction of national standardised assessments, uh, as an example, there will be issues there where uh, they may feel that they would uh, like us to have argued their case exactly as they saw it, uh, to government and therefore change policy in the way they desired. Uh, equally, uh, ministers started with a view. We did absolutely, over a period of time, feed our, our evidence and advice into that. The end result may not be exactly as the EIS would have designed it in the first instance, uh, but I believe it, ma it is based on what we believe is good professional advice around the way forward. And, and indeed, it's, it's quite a unique uh, and progressive development of the use of standardised assessments in schools, I think, which uh, has come out of that. So I think we've got a very good way forward, but it may not be absolutely the one uh, the EIS might have picked if they had the, a free hand at the beginning. So you think their issue is just that they lost the argument and that there's no inherent incom incompatibilities with the way that you are structured no. and set up with reference to both ministers and other agencies? I wouldn't even say they lost the argument. I think uh, I'm sure they were influential also in their views into that. But the, the uh, agreed solution going forward is not perhaps exactly if, they, uh, if at times they felt that it was our role as an agency simply to back up their view that I think that would be incorrect. Just. But I can assure you we had a strong voice in that discussion right the way through. So yeah. both this week and last week, we have had a very thick pack of papers 
from both individuals and from agencies, which I think paints a, a worrying picture. And I think one of the, the, the points of focus that these come down on is that we have curriculum for excellence taking pe pupils up to S3, and then we have a qualification system, and there's a crunch point. That, that the, 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 the requirements to provide that broad general education and then switching into the senior phase, frankly, has placed both a com combination of through a rapid succession of changes, but also just the requirements of what's required from both those things just are incompatible and putting teachers under an awful lot of stress and they just don't feel that they're being supported either by you or the SQA. I mean, would, you, would you agree with that as a, sort of a broad um, assessment of where teachers are right now? I wouldn't agree with that as a broad assessment. I would agree there is an issue that is, uh, schools are currently working through, and we've, it's partly, again, to refer back to the May guidance we put out, was exactly on that issue about how to transition effectively from what should be a rich and broad, broad general education going higher than ever before, actually, to the end of S3, uh, through, but making sure that also sets the groundwork to prepare young people to thrive in the qualifications framework. We have uh, part of the ac activity now underway also is to provide absolute clarity on what level three and level four in the CFE framework mean. Uh, and we're seeing the new benchmarks we issued, and Graham might want to comment, are helping schools uh, understand even more clearly exactly what is expected from broad general education. Yeah, thanks. I mean, firstly, curriculum for excellence doesn't go to the end of S3. It goes up to age 18. It's a, for the first time we've got a curriculum framework that's 3 to 18, with progression from the early years all the way through to, to, to leaving school. And I think, you know, the EIS have issued advice to their members welcoming the recent curriculum for excellence statement and the benchmarks for literacy and numeracy and endorsing some of the key messages. So it would be fair to say that you know, we do uh, work constructively with them on, on uh, the agenda and we do uh, try to represent uh, the views of the profession and our own independent views when policy is, is formed. But I think, uh, as, as Bill said, that the benchmarks are intended, again, just to be very clear on the standard expected within each level of Curriculum for Excellence so that we can see that progression all the way through. And again, it's a significant streamlining activity. I think this is a question of standards. I think it's a question of deliverability. You know, that's what's been very clear from both the evidence session last week and this week. And indeed, you've, you've just admitted that there's an issue. So if there's a problem with the design of both the curriculum and the qualification setup, is that your fault? Is that the SQA's fault? Or is that a fault of ministers in the way that the policy has been uh, conceived? I think the, the curriculum for excellence framework is... Uh, is been endorsed by the OECD um, as the right way forward uh, and it's a case of uh, working together to provide the best support for teachers which is what we're trying to do why we've cut back and streamlined a lot of the advice because for a period there was a request for more case studies more exemplification and we've cut, cut that right back and as I say what we're trying to do just now is pare back the amount of material that teachers get uh, so that they have the absolute advice they need, they have the material they need to make the decisions they're empowered to make, remember, within our curriculum framework locally on what, what best suits the children in front of them. And that's one of the important principles of Curriculum for Excellence, uh, and that's been recognised as a strength of the programme. Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly straight with you, that we're at the point of... Uh, having just run through the first complete run of the new Curriculum for Excellence framework up to S6. I think there's lessons being learnt from that for actually all of us. I mean, and it was collective decision making about how we uh, implemented CFE, but out of that is coming, there's action on our side, which is about reducing and clarifying, make it easier for teachers to access the, the guidance, which they appreciate. There's action for the SQA in terms of cutting back the assessment burden, which they're taking. Uh, but there's also actions very much for local authorities and for schools uh, in terms of ensuring that they are uh, fully embedded approaches which do make it uh, possible for schools to really get the best value out of the new curriculum framework. Uh, just finally, I mean, you, you're standing behind the OECD as sort of essentially a declaration that curriculum for excellence is right. But I mean, if you look at Lindsay Patterson's um, evidence to the committee, 
I mean, he's basically saying that while the OECD, I think, are broadly supportive of the, the, the intent and the overall objectives of curriculum for excellence, they, they're very clear that the evidence is just not avail available as to kind of how, it, it, how effective it's actually been. And more importantly, that we've missed the opportunity to do that evaluation. So I mean, I'm just struggle to understand how you can be so confident that it's all fine and then standing behind the OECD when the OECD is saying themselves that we don't have the basis to actually evaluate and say how well it's been implemented. The, the OEC did not, uh, in my understanding of their report, say that we had missed the boat and could do nothing more about evaluating its impact. Uh, Mr. Parsons says that. But uh, the OECD were recommending that uh, further research was, it would be appropriate now to undertake further research and evidence gathering into impact on, on various aspects that don't naturally uh, flow through from from the improving stats on on SQA results, for example, or imp improving. We do have evidence, of course, of improving levels of positive destinations for young people, and even evidence of the the gap closing uh, to some extent, although not yet fast enough uh, in in terms of outcomes you for say people. Say that the, the, the results on literacy and numeracy um, reflect on on the curriculum changes. There are results of literacy and numeracy from the SSLN surveys, I think, raise issues that we need to be concerned about and address quite directly. Uh, we have uh, picked up, a, there's action underway that we're, we're leading on the maths side, particularly flowing from the last results there. Uh, we certainly do need to make sure those are heading in the right direction. If you want to mention anything about the hub and maths, etc. Yeah, no, there's a, a wide support program um, around improving attainment um, in, in literacy and numeracy, and that is to enable as many children as possible to reach the very high standards we've set in the curriculum for excellence levels. This isn't about basic literacy and numeracy, remember. It's assessing children against the, the new the curriculum for excellence levels, which are very challenging and demanding. And our evidence does indicate that we need to do more to raise attainment. Um, and we need to continue to do that, and we need to continue to close the poverty-related attainment gap in literacy and numeracy. And that's why the Scottish Attainment Challenge is designed around literacy, numeracy, and health and well-being. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. You wanted to come in. Yeah, just really, to continue this point, I'm struck actually that um, your response to a number of the questions is that basically people haven't understood your message. Mm. So local authorities have got it wrong and have had too many boxes to tick. Teachers haven't really been clear about what you've been asking. I wonder. If it feels to me that maybe you should be looking at whether the message you're delivering is one that's creating the problems. And in terms of what your responsibilities are, is to to emphasise this point made by. Uh, Professor Lindsay Patterson. He says, it is now too late to evaluate how curriculum for excellence is working in detail school by school because the moment at which the comparative data could have been collected has passed. Missing that moment might be described as a dereliction of duty by Education Scotland. What is your response to that? Uh, I would uh, need a discussion with Dr. Patterson to really understand what he thought would have been or should have been collected school by school from uh, the start of this process. What I would say is there is uh, a range of evidence which we can track back if we, we wish to do so around school attainment at the secondary level particularly. Uh, where there's less evidence has been around primary level at a school by school or local authority by local authority level. And therefore I'm pleased where uh, government's taken the steps to introduce collection of data on at P147 and Etc. You weren't uh, aware that, that Professor, pa Professor Patterson had this view? Uh, I've heard it before in, in various forms, but yeah. But, and there has not but been a, a conversation with him it, about why he might think something like that? It, as somebody it, who has it, got the, a reputation the, a, well, in education? Indeed, I would speak for him. But fundamentally, it has tended to be associated with a view that uh, more academic research should have been commissioned from the start, a programme of academic research. Uh, the OECD also looked to that. They certainly argue that uh, there should be, they've made a recommendation, there should be a national research strategy, which would be for government to commission. And I believe that's in preparation at the moment. So, okay, so at some point in the future, we may research that. some of this. Did the Curriculum for Excellence implementation group ever discuss mm -hmm. the need to benchmark for Curriculum for Excellence and perhaps take the suggestion to get data school by school? Mm -hmm. And if they did discuss it, why did they reject it as an idea? 
What Dr. Parson may also be unaware of is the fact, of course, that we have regularly reported to CFE Management Board on the outcomes, because, of course, school by school we go into inspections. We have seen how practice has been emerging on the ground. So that has been going on right through. Uh, again, Graham, you want to... Yes, no, on? absolutely. I mean, we do eval Every school that's inspected, the curriculum has been evaluated. Um, and it's been looked at in terms of design of the curriculum, the quality of courses and programmes, where schools have been inspected, obviously, on a sample basis. And that evidence is collated and was reported regularly through the channels that, uh, that Bill described. So whilst there hasn't been a formal research strategy, and that is obviously a recommendation, and that's in the government's delivery plan with a timescale. So it's not just at some point in the future there is a timescale that the, the Scottish Government set out to implement a research strategy. There has been evidence through school inspection, through other engagements. For example, once a year we meet all secondary head teachers and look at the leadership of curriculum for excellence, look at what's happening, and all that evidence feeds back from all the engagement work that we do. Said the simple point is that if you're going to implement a new way of, of doing things, that it might be a good idea to check whether it's making things better or worse by having a benchmark. Now, Professor Patterson seemed to be suggesting is we're doing poorly in numeracy and in literacy. We don't know, because you haven't presumably even discussed the idea of doing this, whether Curriculum for Excellence is tackling that or creating more of a problem. And, you're not, and his point is that, therefore, you, you can only assert that it's a good thing. There is no evidence. And it's quite a serious issue if, in fact, what we've chosen to do is making the problem worse rather than improving things. We have absolutely been monitoring the progress of Curriculum for Excellence through our inspection programme all the, all the way through the programme. Uh, there has also the been... EIS is also mistaken, then. If he, he may well not understand the level of monitoring that goes on through inspection, I, I suspect. But uh, there is also, as I said earlier, been plenty of evidence around the SQA uh, about results which are, and positive destinations in the system. There has... Uh, there is respect, evidence around and perhaps, well, I think, underplayed respect, in his... You would not be able to prove a causal link between Curriculum for Excellence and people getting jobs. You can't do that, I presume. There could be all sorts of other factors. I mean, you could have uh, a brilliant curriculum. Are. I taught in the 80s, the curriculum was excellent, of course but there are. were no jobs. Yeah. Did that mean that the curriculum we, we were pursuing was a failure? And therein, I think, you put your finger on the... The challenges of having an assessment of a programme as broad and far-reaching as Curriculum for Excellence, it will never be possible to make an absolute you know, scientific study of uh, a one-to-one -one correlation between a change to the curriculum and outcomes for young people in a whole variety of ways. It's probably also true of, uh, for example, we're concerned about uh, the SSLN literary results, literacy results, I think, uh, particular dip in writing at, at the upper and early secondary level. Uh, but we know that's an issue that also appears in other countries around the world, and may, it may be as much to do with issues like young people's increasing use of social media and digital technology that we need to adapt and, and change teaching to accommodate rather than what's specifically happening in the curriculum. So there's a range. It's always a complex answer, and there's never a simple track between one piece of data and the six that you can ascribe to curriculum in a simple terms. Okay, thank you. Just before yep. I bring Tavish Scott in for a, a short supplementary, can I just clarify again, you seem to suggest that the data for benchmarking was there or that you would be able to get it to a p position where you would know if, if we had uh, Yeah, it. and just to be clear about by that, I, I'm not sure it, it, exactly what is intended there by the term benchmarking. What, what was there well, throughout... Here, now we want to know where you are, I would say it was benchmarking, yeah. right? Uh, throughout, the, throughout the process, inspection has undertaken, and inspections use quality indicators as our benchmarks, if you like, where inspectors have judged, for example, the curriculum uh, against a six-point scale in every school we've inspected through that period of time. So there is a, a clear professional assessment being made against benchmarks which we publish openly in How Good Is Our School. Uh, and indeed, through the process of implementation, we issued annual updates on exact guidance on exactly how we were interpreting, for example, the curriculum quality indicator. Uh, so yes, we were. Okay. That, in that form, that was happening. Tavish? 
Now, can I just check um, further to Joanne and Daniel's questions? Page 14 of the OECD 2015 report, which of course was commissioned by the Scottish Government, says, and I quote, the evidence is not available for an evaluation of CFE. That's correct. That's your understanding as well. That's... Uh Indeed, I think it would be premature now to say that we had the evidence and could sit down now and make a final judgment about whether in its full form it was... That wasn't the question I asked. I'm just asking you for a matter so, of record. Yeah. Is it not what the OECD said on December 2015? Oh, the evidence yeah, is not uh, available for an evaluation of CFE. I, I absolutely take your yeah, word okay, for that. So I don't have those, it in front of me. Yeah. In those circumstances, further yeah. to all the questions my colleagues have been asking, what was the CFE Management Board doing all these years? The CFE... Uh, Management Board took uh, the view that there was uh, evaluation of CFE should be commissioned. And indeed, I probably uh, would cite the OECD report as probably the most significant example of that because the Management Board was party to the decision that uh, we should invite an independent group of external experts in yes. uh, to have a look at CFE, mm. uh, hence the, the report that you have in front of you. Uh, I think they all, it's also fair to say they rehearse in their uh, report that uh, they understand that a premature leap to assessment of whether or not a programme is successful whilst it's in the process of implementation would also not be helpful, but they do absolutely encourage the system now to uh, step up the assessment effort. But and to I'm create sure that's true, strategy. but CFE, yeah. um, CFE started in 2004. 2009 was when the experiences and outcomes, which are the basis of planning, uh, when it actually hit rubber hit the road in terms of schools beginning okay. to well, uh, have no, it's entirely fair. Well, let's say 2009. Yeah. Also, I yeah. remember P Peter Peacock describing it all in 2004. Yeah, but, yeah there was the review. But, um, group as part but of 2009, it. To, so between 2009 and 2015, there was no, according to the OECD, not me. According to the OECD, there was no evaluation. So we don't know what was happening to our pupils in our schools during that time, other than the inspections. I take the point about the inspections. Yeah. Other than that. Inspections uh, and some data, of course, was continuously available, higher, such as SSLN and such yeah. as the exam results, yeah. pupil destinations. And just and to repeat my question again, yeah. between 2009 and 2015, did, the, did this management board that you've talked about a lot this morning, um, Dr Maxwell, did that board not consider it would be appropriate to provide the education minister of the day, and there have been a number of them in, over that period, maybe he or she never asked, but did it not occur to the management board that it would be a good idea to have an evaluation? on a regular basis so we knew what was going on? Uh, my recollection of the discussions around the management board was certainly that a clear understanding that at an appropriate time, uh, more uh, a comprehensive evaluation should be developed uh, and undertaken. And the OECD yeah. report, as I say, that was, was, the, fir was the first it. part okay. of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Was well, you very briefly. Yeah. Hear about this. What the OECD is arguing is not that you can come out with a, a full-scale measurement of curriculum for excellence and whether it has or has not succeeded, because there's a short time scale. What they are making the point about, and what Lindsay Patterson is making the point about, is that the data that we would need from the instigation of curriculum for excellence until the time that we choose to measure its overriding success, that data has not been collected in the way that would be helpful. That's the point, surely, is it not? That's certainly the argument he's making, and I'd be interested. It's the argument as the OECD is making. As I say, there is some data around. Uh, there are gaps in the data, and I, as I said earlier, I would agree that attainment data that you could drill down to school level, as opposed to the SSLN, which is only available at national level, uh, that uh, would be helpful to have, and that's now going to be forthcoming as a result of the changes made uh, for various reasons. Uh, no doubt the management board uh, didn't uh, create that data earlier. No. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the subject of inspections. And Gillian, you've got a question on that. Thank you, convener, and, and thank you to uh, Education Scotland for our meeting last week, myself and Mr Scott. Um, then, as, now as and then, I'd like to speak about inspections. Um, on your website, it says that you're going to plan to introduce a suite of inspection models which we can use in different contexts and for different purposes. We're continuing to develop our short inspection, localised thematic and neighbourhood review models. Could you clarify what is actually happening in the, the change on in inspections from the previous model to, to these 
uh, thematic, short inspection, local thematic, and what they actually mean. Great, certainly. I'll pass over to Alistair as he's been leading our inspection review, which has been going on for a year or so to develop, redevelop the existing models, but also entering some uh, interesting new territory like an integrated look across the senior phase. Alistair. I've been leading a review since April 2014, uh, and we've had an external reference group involving all the key stakeholders, including professional associations, parents, bodies, directors of education, etc., advising us throughout the course of that review. The situation up until September of this year was that we had a single model, for example, of how to uh, inspect schools. So there was one standard model approach across secondary, primary, whatever. What we wanted to, to move to as a result of evidence and consultation that we had was this idea of a menu or a suite that could be flexed um, to be more proportionate, more risk-based, uh, and to give us the ability to, to, to get around different kinds of themes uh, and issues as they were arising um, in Scottish education. So to achieve that, um, the first element of that was the new set of quality indicators, which were launched in September of last year. And they were allowed a year to bed into the system, and we started using them in inspection from September of this year. Um, and so lots of training events, et cetera, uh, involved in, in getting teachers up to speed with what that meant. So that was how good is our school for. Um, and that's, just to be clear, that's a self-evaluation framework that we also use for inspection. It is not compulsory uh, on schools to use that framework, but about 99% of schools um, use it because they are involved in the development uh, of that framework. The new models have a full model, um, which is similar to what we did previously, but updated with the new um, equality indicators um, that we started. So that's a, a, a full model approach. The, one of the big differences that we had in relation to this was that we're negotiating a quality indicator with the school as part of that model. And the idea of doing that is to try to help the school focus on an issue or a challenge or something that it wants to engage with inspection teams about. Um, and that was a formalized way of doing that. Um, so we piloted these approaches and that is now what we're doing from September. The other models uh, that we'll have in the system are a shorter model of inspection um, and we'll be doing that more systematically from January. We did some again some tryouts uh, of taking less time in school um, and then if there were issues or things that we couldn't uh, find out about we could follow that up by coming back again. So in a sense it's a very risk-based uh, approach. Um, but a shorter period of time in the school. So we'll be doing a number of these from January and then fully implementing thereafter. Um, we are also looking at uh, short notice. Um, very interestingly, agreement of ourselves and the professional associations, it's about a 50-50 split amongst teachers, um, absolutely, nearly almost exactly 50-50, about those who think this is a good idea and those who don't. Parents' bodies obviously would prefer um, us not having a notice um, to the schools and just turning up. So we did again some piloting work around um, the, the idea of short notice. The short notice meant and telling people on the Thursday and arriving on the Monday. Um, we've learned a lot about that and we, the, the, the key thing that we need to put in place is electronic questionnaires um, that we send out in, in advance of inspection. Currently we send that in a paper format, bring them back, collate them and that goes to parents, staff and, and uh, learners and pupils in the school. So we are again, all our inspections from January this, the next year, we'll use an electronic questionnaire as a pilot again so that we can finalise that and then roll out um, some more in an unannounced. Uh, and then the last elements are localised thematic and neighbourhood. Localised thematic, we did a pilot inspection in Murray Council, and that was looking at the senior phase, no matter who the provider was. So it wasn't looking at it just from the school's point of view, it was looking at it from the learner's point of view. How did the college and careers and everything else all work together to make the senior phase work? Um, everyone who was involved in that thought that there was a really added value in terms of our inspection activity, and so we will be rolling uh, some of these out um, over the coming inspection year. And the neighbourhood model is taking that to the next step again, which is saying, if you live in a community, what is it like to learn in that community? Um, and again, no matter of the provider. So in other words, what's your progression in your path from early years right through to your destination coming out the other side? We've done one pilot of that, but we need to do some more uh, work in developing it up as a model. But again, the intention is to have that on the stocks. So we've had some feedback from, from uh, teachers uh, about this and we're also in the EIS submission mentioned it as well um, representing their members and they said that uh, <clears throat> the new inspections I'll, I'll, I'll grant you have only just started to take place but they're still saying that uh, there's 
a variable uh, response from teachers on, on them in terms of the model that you, you, you say you'd like to be more supportive of teaching and learning rather than the kind of the judgment, the over judgment, which which gets people into such a, a, a state over the inspections as was. Um, they said that they centre on confusion around the process of inspection, the lack of opportunity for genuine professional dialogue between teachers and the members of the inspectorate teams, excessive workload and stress that inspection generates for teachers and senior management. And uh, my colleagues, Ross Gray and James Dornan, also went to and spoke to some, some teachers, and they said that inspection still creates a flurry of activity, which risks inspectors not really gaining a real insight into how the school works. And I'm sure you're familiar with that kind of comment. And my question to you is, what feedback do you get from the teachers that you inspect, is there a kind of like reverse feedback coming back from them and how valuable they found the inspections? And do you look at that and would you modify the inspections based on that? Question, I mean, I would want to make one um, uh, slight uh, amendment and that is that these changes that we introduced from September um, we've, you know, are, are changes to our approaches to inspection but we have over a long period of time now for over 15 years been moving towards more professional dialogue, more improvement focused um, activity on inspection. So we aren't switching from September from being about pure accountability to being about improvement. In fact the Scottish approach to inspection is regarded as, be, as genuinely internationally renowned and a lot of inspectors have followed us for being improvement focused. But to answer your, your question directly directly. Um, every single inspection has a post-inspection uh, return from the school um, involved itself, um, where they come back and after the, the, the process is complete, so it doesn't affect the process, they have the opportunity to come back and tell us what they thought and how valuable they felt that the process was. And our statistics show from that response is a very high um, uh, response of people saying that the inspection was valuable. But more than that, we have excellent relationships with the professional associations and we meet with them regularly regularly and they provide us feedback from for example the EIS representatives in the schools that have been inspected and they give us that on a confidential basis and that allows us to get a feel for how we are doing from their perspective as well um, and we do genuinely and we have been particularly low over the process of these last two years when we've been developing and amending and refining these models um, and these new approaches and um, learning from and, and trying to get a consensus about the best way to do inspection in Scotland, which will both achieve the, the requirement of having some level of accountability, because we all want you know, to make sure that the schools are delivering on what's expected of them, parents certainly do, but also alongside that, making things better. So we don't just go and tell people, let's say, read the meter is how it, you know, it could be phrased, tell people what's good or bad, we're actually helping them to understand what they can do to improve. Do you accept, though, that uh, the idea of an inspection for a lot of teachers is still a very worrying thing and the, the workload does increase as a result of it? And, and possibly your, your main message of, about it being support is maybe not getting through to let every teacher who's possibly spending that Thursday to Monday completely and utterly obliterating their weekend, you know, reprinting documentation, spending times in, in the schools. I mean, that, that message really isn't getting through because people are still... Uh, concerned that you know the inspectors come on, on, on the Monday and they need to have everything tickety-boo. We genuinely understand that that is a reaction that people can have and we try through, to, through great lengths um, to, to persuade people that that's not what they should be doing. Um, the whole basis of the Scottish system is based on self-evaluation. The school should have to make no adjustments whatsoever for the fact that an inspection team is coming in. Everything should just be as, as expected. Now, that's easy to say, and of course, um, there will be the running around checking what's on notice boards and you know things like that in advance. When we actually go out and ask um, teachers ourselves, they say that there is, a, there is a, an obvious um, concern about someone coming in to look at your practice, to look at something you've invested your life in. That is there. That is, that, you, you can't stop that in itself. But actually, they have been very positive with the reductions that we have made to what's expected of them in advance of us turning up. And years gone by, there would be rooms filled with paper, and we just do not want that anymore. And we don't demand it anymore. We don't ask for it anymore. There has been an issue whereby local authorities have sometimes tried to, to anticipate when a school would be inspected and do their own kinds of reviews. Now, this isn't universal across the country, but it has actually been raised with us by teacher unions and by teachers that that is more of a concern than it is when actually 
actually happens on an inspection. Um, so it's something that we've engaged with, with local authorities to try to stop this happening, and we're embarking at the moment, or just about to embark on a campaign um, of publicity and information to all teachers, one thing being mythbusters. Um, this idea of saying, you maybe think this is what inspections want, really it's not, and we're going to try to reinforce that through different channels, such as social media, etc., to try to get this information out. Do you accept, just a final question, um, do you accept that when you give a school a, a, a final verdict, that that could really obliterate everything else in the report? Is, is that been something that you've noticed? Are you, are you looking at that? We have an, you will always have an issue where um, you want an accountability element to inspection. And if that's the case, then people want to be able to look at something at the end of the report that says, here are, here are the grades. And there would be an expectation that that, that, that would be there. Um, we want people to look beyond that and read the story of what that school is actually about. Um, we try to encourage people to read beyond um, just reading the appendix at the back. Um, because there is a story, an individual unique story in every single school that we visit. Um, and you will never understand that if you only look at that part. But let's be clear, when you put grades on any kind of school, people live in communities you know, the local media will comment on, on that report. Your parents will comment on that report. Your colleagues, you know, will see that report. It is a natural thing, which if gradings, you know, are part of an inspection system, that you cannot get away from it. You can only mitigate it as much as you can. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard. Thank you. <coughs> you gave a glowing report a couple of weeks ago to Krugelke Primary School in, in Spadeside, so thank you for that. And that certainly did attract media attention. <laughs> Thankfully, for the right reasons. Uh, however, uh, as other members have said, the inspection process is extremely stressful for teachers and schools, and that's one bit of feedback I think constituency members regularly get from speaking to schools and teachers. Hopefully, the short inspections and other improvements you're speaking about will make a material difference to the stress levels. But the other factors that cause stress in the classroom, you know, are variable, and we are taking evidence on budgets. I know we tend to stray into policy in all kinds of areas. It's quite difficult and challenging to focus on budget scrutiny. But in terms of an inspection process and a lack of classroom assistance or whatever it may be, the factors that impact on day-to-day -day teaching, how do you take them into account when you're carrying out your inspections? In other words, presumably your focus is on the delivery of education, the quality of education, but there's so many different factors that influence what's happening in the day-to-day -day life of a school. So how do you take into account the budget issues and pressures that some schools face. Yeah, and, and it is, as you rightly say, it's the focus is on the delivery of education in the school from our point of view when we're doing an inspection. But where we're seeing that's being affected adversely by, say, a constant uh, excess uh, requirement for supply teachers, if schools have to rely on supply teachers. And I know there are particular issues in the Northeast actually around. Uh, availability of staff or specialist subjects and where that's having an impact we will report on it in a school inspection. We certainly then feed back to the local authority but also back into national sources uh, around uh, what we are seeing, where we're seeing it, if that's localised or more widespread uh, and therefore it's one a classic example I guess of where we certainly judge the impact and report on that as it applies to a particular school, but we can also draw out messages from that that we need to feed back into, into government, into policy. So, relating to that, there are some issues I'm aware of in relation to additional support needs and clearly inclusive education and the resources that are applied to that to make sure that we're giving proper educational opportunities to people of all abilities. How do you take that into account and what expertise have you built up in terms of inspecting the SN elements of education? Yeah, and of course most of that now exists in mainstream, although we do have a very active programme of uh, special school inspections as well. We inspect them rather more frequently than other schools quite deliberately because of the uh, consideration that they're more vulnerable pupils in that sense. Uh, so our specialist teams, and we recruit people with additional support needs backgrounds with educational psychologists, like myself actually, uh, who have that kind of background. 
who are engaged in that kind of work, looking at special schools, looking at provision within mainstream schools. Uh, the general trend towards mainstreaming has been, on the whole, a success story in Scottish education, but it still uh, throws up challenges all the time, and particularly uh, with budgets stressed as they are, it's really important that schools maintain uh, the right level of support, including classroom assistants and as well as ESN uh, specialist teachers, uh, in order to meet the needs of young people in mainstream settings. But we are seeing some very good practice in that context. So if you want to mention yeah, that. thanks, Bill. Yes, I mean, I think in terms of the ASL sector, the special schools, most of them do receive over the last three years positive inspection reports. Um, around a third of schools, very good and excellent evaluations. But there is uh, further improvement needed, particularly in the curriculum. 58% um, of special schools have a good or better curriculum on those we've inspected over the last three years. So there is a need to further improve the design of the curriculum in the special sector, and that will be highlighted in our forthcoming report and will require further action in that sector to improve the quality of the curriculum. We are actually active members of uh, a group that was, has been running since the Additional Support for Learning Act came into force. Uh, run by the Government Advisory Group for Additional Support for Learning. And we've been feeding evidence back to that group each year uh, for the report that they publish. It informs the report that that group publishes uh, in its uh, responsibilities for monitoring the implementation of the ASL Act. Uh, so that's another source through which we feed but In, in some parts evidence. of Scotland, like Murray, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. there are no, no alternatives other than to mainstream education do you mm. comment on that or, or look at that as part of your inspection process? I'm aware that's the case very much actually from my own background. I did work in Grampian at one time and I think Murray were all, always very uh, relatively pioneering in terms of developing inclusive provision for young people. Oh, I mean, there are units clearly in some of the schools that have a, of a specialist nature, uh, but we would uh, be looking to Murray. We'd evaluate uh, provision in Murray as in other places, but there may well be good lessons for, from inclusive practice there that can be spread elsewhere. Final question is, in terms of the Cabinet Secretary's emphasis on tackling teacher workload, is it now the case that when you're carrying out an inspection, you will make recommendations on how to reduce teacher workload? Is that a much more uh, focused objective of your inspection process? If we see, and that, this has been happening for some time actually, it's not brand new, but we will challenge schools where we feel, and indeed feedback messages if we feel the authority is requiring them to do things which are generating unnecessary workload for their teachers. We've sent out some very clear messages on that, and I think, as Graham mentioned earlier, the last couple of days, I think the AS, EIS have put out guidance to their members supporting uh, the guidance we provided around tackling teacher workload and encouraging their members to adhere to it and to indeed challenge management if necessary in their schools if they feel that unreasonable things are being demanded. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Arch. The convener, this very much goes back to the points Gillian Martin was making around inspections. And when the convener and myself met with a group of teachers, one of the, the phrases that come up was that inspectors will uh, very regularly be hit by the smell of fresh paint upon entering a school. Um, but if we Take as a start the assumption that inspections do result in positive outcomes improvement uh, in the schools. There's a trend in the, the data that we've got from the various surveys, our own and uh, your surveys, obviously different methodology, but the trend's quite clear. The further away from the classroom an individual is, the more likely they are to see inspections as positive and see them as having a positive outcome. So almost all the heads of education in your data uh, are very positive about uh, the outcomes of inspections. Head teachers, fairly positive, frontline classroom teaching staff, less so. Why do you think that's the case, that the further away from a classroom someone gets, the more positive a view they have of inspections? I guess, uh, I mean, to some extent, that feels like a natural trend to me. It is fundamentally the classroom and the teacher who, uh, the teacher in the classroom who is being, uh, feeling their, uh, the process will very much focus on them, although fundamentally we look at a school as a whole and not we don't rate individual teachers in any sense. Uh, and of course it may be well be the case that uh, some time uh, 
not that often that any individual teacher in a classroom will experience an inspection, whereas it's uh, much more part of the uh, daily working life of local authorities as we're uh, dealing with inspections on a much more regular basis. So staff are based there, and indeed head teachers who get regular briefings from ourselves or conferences are probably uh, naturally just more attuned to how the process works these days. Um, but yeah, and I would never underestimate that, of course, it's a, a process in which you feel a, a certain degree of pressure. That's pr only right. And in a sense, people are passionate uh, about what they do and want to show their best side in any uh, external review process of that sort. It's also worth pointing out, though, I think every all our inspection teams also involve peer associate assessors, we call them, but they're basically folk from other schools, uh, head teachers from schools in a different authority who have trained with us as associate assessors, uh, trained in inspection methodology. And so inspection teams always include uh, people like that, team members who are associate assessors as well as HMI. And that in itself is a powerful way of spreading understanding about quality improvement across the system because we're regularly told about by those people uh, how valuable an experience they find it to be part of a team going in to see a school in a different authority. Uh, excellent CPD, they invariably tell us. So there's a, a, a spin-off benefit from inspection to the wider system that, in that way too. I, I think we can all understand that for the frontline teaching staff, of course, inspections are going to be stressful. Regardless of the, the circumstances they come yeah. under, there's an element of stress. This is more about a belief that the outcomes have been positive. So it can be both a stressful, unenjoyable experience, and you can still have faith that there will be a positive outcome from it. That seems to be the issue. There's less faith from frontline teaching staff that there will actually be a positive outcome. I mean, do you take on board uh, the feedback from EIS in particular that there should be more focus on the education authorities as part of the inspection programme? We th I would uh, agree, I explained earlier about the three-layer system, schools and their own self-evaluation being the vital front line of that. Uh, the local authority level is also important, so we do have arrangements for uh, engaging regularly, continuously with local authorities and indeed feeding into an annual scrutiny arrangements with other inspectorates, which uh, effectively risk assesses each local authority in terms of their ability to uh, quality improve and assure their schools uh, and other education services. So it is an important level and it's important we do engage with uh, evaluating and also supporting authorities to build their capacity to quality assure their own schools. But I do think it's still important that we do sample that occasionally and actually go in and see what's happening on the front line in Murray or Aberdeenshire or Scottish borders to Absolutely. get a I think sense the communication, of how that's working. The, the communication afterwards seems yeah. to be essential here that the communication with frontline teaching staff isn't at a point where they have faith that there are positive outcomes from these inspections. The further away from the classroom you get, there's more faith that there's been a positive outcome. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Um, Dr. Maxwell, I just wonder if I could pursue some issues relating to some data that you published uh, about inspection activity and also the number of inspectors. And this is on the back of um, promises made by both the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Education, who intimated earlier in the year that the number of inspections uh, would increase. And uh, obviously that, uh, by definition, I would have thought would lead to an increase in number of inspectors or greater frequency, perhaps, in the number of inspections that they carry out. The table that you have given us, however, tells us that the number of inspections projected is actually continuing uh, to decline. Uh, in 2012-13 for preschools, it was 162. It's going to be 99 next uh, session. Primary, 101 down to 90. Secondary, 26 down to 17. How does this tie in with a promise to increase inspection? Yeah, I'll hand over to Alistair who can explain some of the detail more uh, in more depth around the projections. Uh, the table that I th I think uh, yeah, our office provided for SPICE to, to give you on this. It doesn't contain projections. In fact, it also illustrates, I think, pretty clearly the wide range of different inspections. So it doesn't contain projections, did you say? It does contain yeah, projections exactly. for all sectors, and it shows the very wide range of areas in which we're now uh, actively quality assuring an inspection. Uh, but in schools particularly, because I know that's what you'll be particularly interested in, primary and secondary schools, Alistair, you can maybe update. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, it, it's very clear. The, 
the first fact to say is that the figures are projections, and obviously, you know, they change and they move up and down regularly. Um, and that's just a fact because of things such as um, staff illness, inability to go to a particular school at a particular time due to something happening there that we find out about after notification, weather, all the rest of it. Um, so we constantly update um, those. Um, our, our expectations is that this year we'll do the same number of school inspections as we did last year, and that's where we'll end up at the 31st of March uh, in terms of the financial year. The increase will happen significantly next year, and that's because of two factors. Um, one is that we took on board an additional nine inspectors recently. They are still in probation, uh, and so they are not contributing to additional numbers at the moment. They should be fully deployed as lead inspectors um, to add to the inspection numbers from April, but that's an individual judgment um, based on each individual person's ability to be able to do that, or readiness to be able to do that, and I'm sure schools would welcome the fact that we take our time to make sure that they are ready to lead inspections. And the second uh, main factor will be the shorter inspection model, which will allow us to do more inspections overall, um, whilst retaining that risk factor element, which will allow us to go back should we have to. So it, when you say for 2016 that there are 66 uh, full-time equivalent ins inspectors, for 27 you're saying that it's um, going to be nine additional to that. Is that correct? And that's uh, weather um, permitting on your forecast? I would have to check that figure. I'm not sure when that, that figure relates to. Um, uh, that, that's so still lower. I suspect those nine are in the right. 66. But for but example, we have an advert in, uh, which is already placed um, yeah. for inspectors in next week. Um, it's a constantly changing thing because we have people retiring, we have you know, the need for new staff, um, so we are the numbers again uh, go up and down. It's given, you know, uh, as you well, we are current retirement law, you used to be able to predict very, very clearly when your numbers were going to, to, to change, but nowadays you can't. So, um, we Sorry, have to I'm not quite clear why that is. I mean, the, the main issue here is that obviously um, parents and teachers and pupils uh, want a good understanding of the inspection process. And the, the, the data that we have in front of us shows that the number of inspections uh, is declining in schools and also the number of inspectors, despite the, the nine additional ones that you're projecting for 2017, that will still actually be fewer uh, than the number of inspectors um, back in uh, 2011 when it was uh, 81. In fact, it was in 2010, it was 83. So that's still uh, fewer that are being projected. Now, the, the issue is that if we are wanting to build a world-class inspection programme, the, the natural question is why are there fewer inspections uh, now and fewer inspectors? Does that not make your job very much more difficult? Um, <laughs> to be clear on one thing, there will not be fewer inspections of schools um, this year than there were well, last year. So the figures that were being supplied were a projection of in the summer of, uh, uh, of this year. And what I'm saying is so that the projections not right. now... Yeah, our projections now um, would be likely that it would be the same number. That's purely a natural process inside the organisation. The projections are constantly updated. Um, that figure is a formal projection of 107 because that is of schools because that is the staff that we knew that we had deployed. What sorry, we've done is we have Mr. taken. Mr. Delaney, on can I just stop you there? I'm sorry to interrupt, but it says here for preschools um, for the, the the academic session that's just passed, it was 135, and your projection, which is intimated here, is 2016-17, is 99. Primary schools, it was 97, it's going to be 90. And secondary schools, it's 18, it's going to be 17. That's a reduction in all three categories. Yes, so for schools, I'm saying, for schools, I'm saying, there will, we, will, we, will, and we believe we will do exactly the same number, if not a little bit more than what we did last year, by the time we reach 31st down. March, because a projection can go up or can go down. Um, but our belief now, given the extra resource that we have deployed there, that that is the case. However, you are correct to identify that in early years, it is the case that there is a reduction this year. And so, for example, you will see the advert next week is specifically asking for expertise in early learning and childcare so that we can boost this number back up again, because we have lost expertise in that area. Um, so by that point, we, we should go back you know, to where, where we were. Over the piece, because we have these new inspectors who are going through their induction, then next year, from the 1st of April, we will see an increase overall in the number of inspections. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd we'll be happy, by the way, to provide updated projections because they, they have changed primarily because we have, uh, and we a couple of months ago, uh, looked at our budget mid-year and agreed to take on some. Uh, we often, we regularly indeed use re uh, retired inspectors on a contract basis 
to undertake some inspections, and we, we do that regularly. Yeah, those, those uh, and we have be helpful. well down the track of contracting some people. Okay, if you could do yeah. that, that'd be great. Yes. Very quickly. Good. Thank you, Very Karina. Quickly. Just one supplementary on that. When, um, Dr Maxwell, when your board is considering the inspection regime, not the numbers, I take your answers on mm. the numbers, um, your board is considering that inspection regime at the same time as your board is presumably considering all the guidance that's been given to schools and, and the, the pressures that you've been describing this morning. Yep. Is there a correlation between the two? Uh, a correlation there certainly we look across the whole piece if, if that's what you mean in terms of how we are uh, managing our resource and budget yes we need to make strategic decisions in fact i think in my opening comments i was indicating that we are uh, we feel the demand for us to put resource into the guidance and development area is lessening it's certainly not disappearing but it is lessening and that we can redirect some resource into two things one one has been the work like the attainment challenge where we have created these attainment advisor posts for example mm -hmm. but another area is to build up our inspection program it's, it's to richard, some degree, it's richard again. Again. question we're yeah. on the budget and i suppose i should ask a budgetary question yeah. Um, yeah. did you reduce the number yeah. of inspectors that were available to inspect schools because you had to put more into attainment advisors because that was the government's priority these things all interact out of a fixed budget, <laughs> undoubtedly. Uh, we didn't reduce, no. Uh, what we did do, and uh, let's be quite clear about this, is we reduced the number of inspections we undertook in the er mid-years, early years of Education Scotland's existence. And those people, quite often actually, it was inspectors spending time uh, on supporting and advise on some of the curriculum developments that were going on. Uh, there's also an element now, inspectors can't inspect all 220 days of their working life. It's uh, just, just practical reality that they uh, have other ways which they can... So uh, inspectors were doing in. part, of the job, part of their job was also to, to advise on guidance that was to, going to schools? To feed into, uh, as yeah, they would have done That's in interesting. previous thank days. You. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Liz, you wanted to come in and see... Yeah, yeah. On the subject choice yeah. question, which um, you referred to sure. earlier, uh, last week, uh, when Dr Brown was in front of us, um, she said very clearly that she thought a very important conversation had to be had about the senior phase and the uh, concerns that uh, there is a narrowing of the curriculum within that senior phase. And just to go back on uh, the comments that Tavish Scott made earlier, are you concerned about the narrowing of the curriculum in the senior phase? I don't accept that there is uh, an issue a narrowing looked at in the broad scheme of things. Senior phase actually is about offering a much broader and richer set of pathways for young people taken as a whole, looked at a three-year programme. Uh, and we're seeing good evidence of that with, for example, increased uptake of vocational qualifications uh, at a higher level with greater uh, parity of esteem of those. Uh, we are also, just to be clear, broad general education uh, provides greater breadth in the curriculum rather than narrowness up to the end of S3, whereas previously uh, that was not the case. Uh, so it's a different pattern of curriculum. Uh, we are looking, it's a very active discussion, I think, that needs the cur Curriculum for Excellence Management Board is engaged in and needs to continue to engage in uh, looking at the new models that are emerging, but we are seeing some very effective new models emerging. Would you accept the point that there is <clears throat> some pressure on subject choice that in some schools there is a reduction in the number of subjects uh, that some pupils can take and that having been through uh, S3 with the experience that they've had there going into S4 they are forced because of the number of hours and because of the, the way that the courses are structured into a, a, a much reduced subject choice. Is that correct? What's happening is pupils are moving from a broader base in, in third year than previously, as I say, uh, typically into a smaller number in S4 than would previously have been in the case. Uh, rather than eight, it's probably six or seven subjects. Uh, following through into fifth year and sixth year, ideally in programmes. What I'd like to see more of, actually, is, is the original intention of two-year programmes being uh, young people going into effectively more able pupils bypassing, to use the shorthand, which was always part of the intention. Uh, maybe not in all their subjects, maybe in some of their subjects and some not. Uh, all of these models are possible and we're seeing some of the better uh, design curricular uh, 
models that are, are emerging in schools, beginning to really explore that and also using uh, freeing up their thinking about even mixing age groups so that uh, it's really not a one-size-fits-all for young people as they go into <coughs> fourth year, It's an interesting, year, year. interesting point you make, but philosophically, yeah. uh, and back again to your curriculum uh, design teams and the discussions yeah. you have as the board, what was the philosophy behind having a very broad general education up to S3 and then a, a much narrower senior phase. What, yeah. What's the philosophy behind yeah. that? In a, in a nutshell, it's really about taking young people broader, uh, higher and broader, and uh, we include in these the broader achievements as well as the exams and subjects. Uh, hence, we're pleased to see the rise in Duke of Edinburgh Awards and John Muir Trust and Leadership Awards as well. Uh, that that entitlement to a broad education should be absolutely clear up to 15, fundamentally, end of third year. Uh, and from there, it was, of course, pupils would start to narrow, if you want to put it that way, would start to choose pathways which were coherent pathways that would lead them right through. I, I'm just and echoing... It might involve school, might involve college, might involve a range of things. Yeah, I'm yeah. just echoing the views so. of parents who feel that in some schools, because they are forced down to fewer hires than would have been possible in past generations, oh. that, that, you know, that they've, got, they've got an issue about... Uh, compromising subject choice. That, that's the point I think Dr Brown was concerned about that. I'm just anxious to know whether Education Scotland's concerned. Uh, we're concerned to see really good models emerging. I haven't seen fewer hires as an issue. I, I think, in fact, there's larger numbers of hires being achieved than ever before in the last couple of years. Uh, the, issue, the issues discussed with us are more around fourth year, to be honest, but, but I think that's... Uh, not looking at in isolation, you know, looking at this as a three-year phase and actually across those three years there's more opportunities to do more qualification and awards than there was previously. So if you look at S4 in isolation, it could look like you're going from broad to narrow, but that is not the design of CFE. It's, it's a three-year experience with lots of opportunities to make choices, uh, to look at different pathways and to build up a wide portfolio of achievements and skills. Yeah. Briefly done. We've seen an excess of a 40% drop in the number of pupils sitting um, higher French and German. Would that not be evidence of the narrowing of the of, uh, options that you say you don't have evidence of? Sorry, I don't have those figures right in front of me. Uh, well, if those you... subjects are, be, are uh, as I say, what I, I do know is that uh, the number of hires being achieved in the system as a whole has increased. So... Uh, if there are shifts between some subjects and other subjects, there must be some going up or some going down. But uh, yeah, the point's been made. Uh, Colin, to. Colin B. Thank you, could get well. They're not our figures, but I'm sure you'll have them from the open source. Sorry. I'd like to uh, move to resources and budgeting. Yeah. Now, I believe you take a, a zero-based budgeting approach. Is that common in the public sector? Ah. Ah. Hard for me to judge uh, how many other organisations do exactly uh, take that approach. I suspect it's becoming a little more common because we're all, like all other public bodies, we're uh, needing to manage, uh, exercise very careful husbandry over what has, is a pretty tight resource, understandably, these days. So we have found it valuable to go back to take an approach which fundamentally questions uh, every year refreshes the questioning of do we need to be doing this and if not can we move that resource to do something that's now a higher priority. But if you're rebuilding your budget in total every year that's hugely time consuming and incredibly yeah. resource intensive. I, I would uh, point many of our programmes uh, we profile them over a longer period than one year so they might have a three year horizon for example uh, so as you're going to it this year, for example, we're rolling forward the programmes which we created for the first time last year. Many of them have a broad profile, which will then be tweaked and adjusted rather than completely so designed it's not from fact scratch. Completely so a zero-based budgeting process. Uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I did, but Alice, you want to? No, I mean, just obviously, if you have a one-year spending settlement, then in that sense as well, that's what we've had um, each year go, going back. Then when we gave evidence last year, we said, you know, I said uh, specifically it was a zero-based budgeting, and that's what we were taking forward. But when we introduced the programme approach, we did allow the programmes to put a profile. That's at a life cycle, where they were projecting their resource use. All we're saying is that that's not a given, that we have to, every year, revisit that and make sure that that still stands up. 
take it that you're, you're using a hybrid budgeting process, in yeah. fact. No, yes. uh, the portion Especially. of the budget that is really incremental budgeting, doesn't that need specialist training? Well, we have um, specialist staff within the organisation in, in uh, planning and performance and, uh, and finance staff. So as an agency, we're not all educationalists. We have a lot of uh, specialist staff <sighs> to support us yeah. in how to do this. You'd have specialists in the centre, but the people that are actually on the coal face that are feeding back the information that will, that will inform that budget need to understand the uh, incremental uh, accounting that's involved in this. No, I'm not sure they need to know the technical element. What they need to feed back on is um, how effective the activities that, that we've been undertaking during that, you know, the current year are actually having um, uh, on the learning experiences in Scotland. So, I mean, we have a lot of feedback loops. We have a lot of discussions with key project leaders, for example, of key pieces of work. Um, at this time of year, it's the key um, point of doing that because we're reviewing um, all the programmes to make sure that we're clear what the resource requirements are for next year as we speak uh, and then that will be profiled and put together. Mm. What about uh, intangible outputs? How, how do you factor that in in terms, of, in terms of having the portion of the budget that's zero based? I'm not sure what you mean by intangible. Well, outcomes. there's intangible outcomes where there's no direct uh, fiscal element in the budget, but there is an outcome which has a notional uh, value. Um, we take a, a very structured approach to this, um, which we've been developing over the last few years. So every programme has a set of outcomes and a set of performance measures, and all of our corporate functions have KPIs. Um, so that allows the start of the programmes to be about what are we trying to achieve, irrespective of resources, and then the resources built uh, below that. So there could well be, um, just by dint of, you know, of doing certain activity, other outcomes which are identified for each of the programmes that don't require resource. And I would highlight that, um, given our resource base is 80% staff, uh, and very little other uh, spend that we can actually make when you take off accommodation and travel and subsistence, for example, um, then most of it is about the deployment of our staff and how effective they are and what difference they are making. If effectively you've moved into a hybrid budgeting process, what about uh, uh, your fiscal indicators and your trend analysis? Won't that be quite difficult to do comparisons when you're, form when you're formulating this sort of budget? I would have to take absolute specialist advice as to whether it's, it, it is that difficult. From my perspective, we can take an overview over the past number of years and see where our trends have been. We have that. We have monthly performance reporting in year, uh, which makes it clear what the trends are in terms of you know, spend against forecast, but also in terms of impact, what difference things are making. We make adjustments, as Bill referred to earlier, when we made adjustments to the inspection process in August, September, and um, resources going there. That was as, as a result of a mid-year um, uh, exercise that we undertook to see where we were. Um, so there's a lot... We, we have a very well rehearsed and, and, and rigorous process of understanding where our spend is going and what difference we're making. But if this is the first year that you've actually brought in uh, zero-based budgeting, then your trend analysis is going to be distorted. No, it was the opposite in a sense. We were doing zero-based budgeting up till this point where we introduced the new programmes from 1st of April. When the, when the new programme approach, rather than a structural, organisational structure approach to planning our work, we introduced a programme approach from the 1st of April. At that point, every single programme had set out its longer term objectives and had a life cycle at that point. Um, all I'm saying is that now for this year, we're revisiting that to make sure that that's still appropriate and updating it in light of what we've learned this year. OK, that point wasn't clear from the information I had. So if you've been doing zero-based budgeting up to this point and you're now going on to more hybrid basis, is that because of resource constraints? Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, we are under resource constraints. I mean, you know, I, I, I would want to, to, to highlight that. I mean, from 2012-13 to 15-16, we, we had a reduction of about 12% in our, in our budgets. Um, and in 16-17, in the spending review last year, 7% uh, reduction in our budgets. Now, we have to manage that. Now, that is not different in other parts of, of public service. So um, that's just an exercise we have to go through. What that's meant is that we have to revisit whether what we are doing is having the impact that we expect it, um, expect it to do. And we've had to 
to, for example, ask more of our staff by being more agile and responsive in terms of their deployment, for example, whilst bearing down on core costs of the agency, which of course we would be doing anyway. You've also mentioned here about specialist skills and problems in recruiting staff with specialist skills, particularly on the IT side, and we're well aware um, from other examples in the public sector where there have been difficulties in that. How are you handling that? How, are, how is it being coordinated? We under, there's an understanding that there is, there is a central process, more or less, for this now. How do you fit into that? Yeah, I mean, we, um, as an executive agency, follow all this Scottish Government protocols, obviously, and we are therefore keyed into things like the, the process you're talking about for IT staff through Digital Directorate. Um, and when we're looking for certain skill sets, we are able to go through ISIS, the, the, the core government IT provider, um, and uh, Digital Directorate to try and identify the skill sets we need, in particular for short-term pieces of work. So we have, for example, access to the Lockheed Martin contract, which we have used to develop pieces of, of development work in the IT area, which we've needed to do, such as the National Improvement Hub. Um, that's invaluable to us because especially for the specialist level of skill and the amount of time we might need that skill, there is no way that we could uh, attract um, you know, the, the skills and expertise that we would need in an agency like ours. Um, and obviously, as you know, there's issues about the salary levels that certain people would expect. I would also want to highlight in terms of specialist skills, though, we have an issue with educational expertise as well, um, because as the fiscal constraint applies across ourselves at national level and at local authority level, there are less, there's less ability for us to take secondees out of the system um, in education providers as well. They are, they are not willing to come uh, and they are too busy doing their own job in their local area. And so we need to, you know, to bear that in mind in terms of our, our constraints as well. Looking again at your budgeting process, uh, According to, the, according to yourselves, you reprioritise your resources in June 16 over the education delivery plan. Now, what impact did that have on your budget? How did you handle that? And what has been the impact? Did you have to restate the budget? Um, we had to, to do some, it wasn't just the budget, but our total resource allocation, we had to have an exercise of, of reprioritising and moving resources to deal with what were then uh, in-year higher priorities than what we had originally set. Uh, and we did that through our structured process to identify what our commitments were in the delivery plan, whether those we, we graded them, whether they were already within what we were going to do or whether they were a new ask. And then we you know, reorganised our resource profile to be able to deliver on it. About reprioritisations for a, for a fixed period. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Joanne, very briefly. Yeah, I might just, every possibility I lack, no specialist knowledge in this, and this is all a very um, big learning curve for me. In each of the years from 2013-14, a third of your budget by the end of the year is transferred within the year. Is that because, does that, because it's remarkably similar right along the, the, the columns, is that in order to allow you to address new government initiatives? And if that were the case, you would be able to sustain your longer term planning for the core budget that you've been identified for? The in-year transfers are previously agreed at the beginning of the year pieces of work that we are being asked to undertake where the money is held elsewhere. And so at some point during the year, there are only two points of the financial year where you're allowed to make transfers. That money is transferred notionally across to our budget to account for that. But we are being asked, for example, by policy divisions within the government to undertake a specific piece of work. They're giving us a specific amount of money to do it. A lot of that money as well, though, is grants. We are, we are supplied money um, to coordinate grant giving to other organisations. So the money comes into us and we then distribute the money um, to the, the grant receivers. The reason for doing that was because we are applying a greater level of control and strategic oversight of those grants than was possible prior to us having them. So when you have you, the approach that uh, my colleague understands in more detail than I do, it's not really zero-based budgeting, although you called it that. Is that the purpose of that, to recognise that there will be government initiatives which will not be fully funded, and you therefore have to, although you've got a long-term plan, you then have to shift resources quickly. Yeah. And does that mean you would be encouraging people to be rather short term or, or present what they're doing in a slightly different way than if they had the space to develop something over a period of time when they know they've got the budgets behind them? 
I mean, I won't, you know, hide from the fact that there is always a tension between our long-term planning of what we would believe that we want to do and, you know, pressures and new ideas, new things that come along uh, during the course of any particular year. Um, a lot of the time, though, it's about changing emphasis. It's not necessarily about stopping entirely doing one thing and start to do something different. It's about a change in emphasis in relation to a pressure during the course of the year. Government initiatives which are underfunded. <laughs> well, um, it certainly can be driven by government initiatives where we are, uh, need to reprioritise some of our own existing resource to meet them. I mean, the attainment advisors would be a classic example of that. Uh, Thank you. They were doing so well as well. Okay. Thank, right. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of this session. Can I thank the witnesses for their, their time? And that's public session over. Thank you.